Hi, you're watching Level With Me and today we're going to level with YB Zyria. Hello YB Zyria. Hi Shazwan. Hi, so you're yeah, straight from Penang? Uh, from Parliament actually. From the Parliament? Yeah. Okay YB, can you tell me, uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Five things about yourself. Five things about myself. Yeah, that, that you know, not the uh, political side of you, not, not the Parliament side of you, but the you that you want people to know. Um, well, actually, um, I didn't get asked this question a lot. I, I'm, I'm wondering what to say. Um, perhaps uh, not many people know that I'm a big Michael Jackson fan. Uh -huh. I mean, I grew up, of course, we all, anyone who grew up in the 80s is a big Michael Jackson fan. That's true. I was particularly a huge Michael Jackson fan. I got to see him when he came to KL, uh, which is, you know, I consider one of the great memories of my youth. Um, and I think uh, when he passed away, of course, it was a very significant uh, event for me. Uh, um, and uh, I, I'm also, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but I can do some of his moves as well. Oh, maybe, you know, and, uh, you can do one of the moves in camera? Uh, <laughs> maybe later on, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> With the moonwalk, you know? Um, I can do some of it. Do <laughs> me, uh, me, yeah, yeah, sure, that'd be cool. Okay, uh, how about uh, uh, other interests? Like, uh, are you. Are you uh, well, I, I, I. Yeah, I, I'm into sports. Um, I used to play football, tennis, I still play. Do you, do you watch football, though? I do. Um, I support Penang. I go for almost every game. Oh, that's uh, so good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I've also been to the World Cup. Once, when I was a student, and then there was the 2006 World Cup in Germany. Germany, yeah. And uh, I was I was studying in the UK at the time, so I managed to get tickets. I was so happy, and uh, I went for a match. Uh, how about the EPL? Are you a fan of uh, Manchester? I am not a fan of any particular team. I do watch the games. Uh, I'm rooting for you know underdog Leicester to win right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'm a big Arsenal fan, so oh, well. you know there's a big rivalry there. You guys had a good chance this season. <laughs> it's always like that with Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's, yeah. that's true. So, um, okay. Uh, from you know, since you you since you go and watch uh, pinning matches every now and then, I can see how passionate you are about the island. I mean, the island is. A, it's a very beautiful island, uh, rich with uh, variety, food choices, culture, and you can you can see that Penang's uh, way in uh, visualizing the culture to art performances is something else. It's not, it's not something that you 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 see in Malaysia. Um, but if you had to pick one Penang specialty, uh, uh, you know, like one thing that in Penang that you you like to put forward to for for, for the whole world to see, what is it? The number one thing. One thing, yeah, from from all the crazy things, crazy good things happening. Uh, it has to be the food. It has to be the food. Obviously, it's the food, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the, the food, you know, like you know, we have uh, the Penang laksa, the amazing char kway teow. Yeah. So, uh, what what specific 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 food that you actually? Uh, that's a, that's a question that's completely impossible for anyone. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Everything in Penang is good, and uh, I mean, it's just the one thing. Well, I, I'm crazy about food, and uh, I'm, I'm 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 the kind of guy who would go out of my way just to eat something that I find uh, that I really want to eat. Uh, and you know, living in Penang is it's, it's you know it's um, it's really uh, the most blessed place to live in. Yes, it's, it's, it, your is. Foodie. it is. You know, it is. It's good food everywhere, anywhere, anytime. Uh, I cannot pick one. There's no way. Yeah, that's yeah. Just, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, but you know, in you see the the food, the F&B industry in Penang is it's not just uh, booming. It has always been uh, you know one of the uh, biggest attractions, not just in Penang but in Malaysia. Tourists come to KL, and after that, they would want to go to Penang Street. So, what do you think will happen in ten years? Do you think the 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 quality of the food industry in Penang will increase, or will it be will it be uh, stagnant? Or what about the other uh, parts of Penang? Do you think that in ten years it will be better, or will it be uh, the same way? Or? Well, I think Penang is in a good place right now. I think Penang is on the right path right now. Uh, in terms of food, there is one concern. I mean, the concern is always that because a lot of these, you know, the great famous hawker foods and so on and so forth, these are family recipes and they're usually family run. Uh, question is, um, 
will the children continue? Yeah. And so, most of the times, because of social mobility and you know, you're able to earn and obviously send your children for better education, a lot of these kids don't want to continue the family business. Uh, some of them just go on to do other things, work in the uh, corporate sector and so on and so forth. So there's always that concern. What happens when this generation of hawkers uh, you know, move on? Uh, and who will continue? Um, so, I think in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, that will probably be, uh, be a problem. It could be a problem. Um, but of course, the state government in Penang, for example, has, uh, you know, has taken a few measures to try to ensure that we keep the food within uh, Penangites and uh, instead of... Uh, because it's really the greatest attraction of Penang. I mean, Lonely Planet has, has stated, yes. you know, greatest street food in the world, Penang. Uh, and that's why people come to Penang. In fact, um, Hotel f &B in Penang doesn't do as well as, say, in KL because nobody comes to Penang to eat in hotels, right? Everyone comes to Penang to eat street food. Yeah. Uh, so, but the question is, what happens when this generation moves on and the kids don't take over? What, what happens to the recipes? What happens to these Yeah, uh, exactly. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a worrying thing. Yeah, so, but yeah. You mentioned that uh, the Penang government is taking a few measures. What, what are those measures? Oh, what, one of it is, uh, of course, to... Well, there's now a ruling that all... There's a list of uh, famous Penang fare, uh, and if it's street food, uh, it cannot be cooked by foreigners, for example. So you oh, can't yeah. you know, hire a yeah. foreigner to cook your, ch your local chocolate tail if you're a hawker. In a hotel, it's fine, but you know, if you're a hawker, just to ensure that you know, the, the skills are kept within uh, the cultural tradition of Penang. Oh, that, there's a really, there's something where, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, monetary things, you know, for instance, like, you know, the, the youth, you know, people like us, people like, uh, people who from Penang come to KL, especially uh, the young ones, they, they're in search for job opportunities and all, but how do you uh, ensure them that, you know, the, the FNB line in Penang can actually bring them, you know, a good future? Well, I mean, um, well, that, that's a good question. I think it's, uh, which is why I said it's a real concern. Uh, it's a question that we'll probably be grappling with. I mean, there's no real easy answer to that. That's true. Um, but bigger question about retaining or actually getting our youth to stay back in Penang is also something that we, 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 we talk about. Um, so we've started actually last year a, a state government scholarship fund called the Penang Future Foundation. Uh, so if there are anyone out there, and, and it's not only open for Penangites, it's actually open for all Malaysians. So if you're an SPM leaver and you wish to study uh, in the fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or accounting, you can actually apply for the scholarship. Um, uh, we started with a 20 million ringgit fund, and essentially the only condition attached to the scholarship is after graduating, uh, you have to work in Penang. No, that's a yeah. really good one. That's a really good one. All right. So uh, also uh, off late, you know, off late, the Penang has been blessed with um, the presence of a lot of. Uh, artworks and streets and galleries and all and in in a way it has not just changed how how people in Penang you know live their lives but you know it has changed the demographics of uh, of tourists of people coming to Penang they not they not just want to uh, spend their time but the fringi you know all those days but the fringi Tanjubunga uh, Gurni but now they want to they want to see the art as well in Penang what uh, how do you think that has changed the island Tremendously. I mean, uh, before 2008, essentially what you had was uh, the inner city of Penang uh, in decay, uh, in decline. Uh, then we got heritage status, UNESCO World Heritage yes. Status in 2008. Then, you know, sort of uh, gave life because then you basically all the old buildings had suddenly had value. Uh, people came in, they invested, uh, you know, they turned them into very nice boutique hotels, boutique cafes and so on. Uh, and then. Uh, very interestingly, an organic development happened as well, which yes. is the you know the street murals that you yes. see now, uh, and, and these things are not straight, uh, are not state led. You know, it's not state driven. Uh, the only role the state has to play in these things is essentially to not play a role, step back, and to allow it to happen. Uh, whereas you know sometimes you see in other states, uh, if you were to draw something on a wall, you know the council might come in and obviously yeah. uh, clean it off. Uh, and so on, but in Penang, we actually allowed it to happen and, and then just took a life of its own. So I think one of the greatest things uh, that we've done in Penang is to allow um, sort of art and culture to grow organically, uh, but we've also supported uh, these efforts through, for example, the Georgetown Festival, uh, which is now uh, you know, quite a famous worldwide yes, uh, it is. Uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, and 
It's something that is the complete, uh, the state doesn't play an active role in determining what the program should be. We basically there's funding from the state and we allow um, creativity uh, to just, you know, take off from there. That's a really interesting concept, isn't it? Um, the thing is, um, the, the, the art, you know, the, the artistic uh, uh, value of the streets now has it's rocketed, you know, it's just from this uh, st uh, streets into art streets, you know, the Armenian street yeah, yeah, yeah. with, with Arnold Zekovic's uh, works. But how, how, the, how did it, how did these streets, how did the transformation of Penang streets into something even more has affected the students of Penang? And as you know, the education system is uh, rather not really artistic in a way. And Art has played a very small role in the education system. What do you think about that? What do you think has uh, the art scene in Penang, has it affected the Penang students in a way? Well, I think, um, I think the growth of this art scene, uh, as you call it, uh, actually we now see more interest in the arts, uh, especially among youth. Uh, there are various uh, organizations also trying to promote uh, arts and cultural programs among the youth, uh, arts ed and so on. Uh, and you also see, I think, greater enrollment in the arts colleges uh, and you see more students actually taking part uh, in these programs. Um, but I think generally uh, what you see now is Penang becoming a hub or, or a center for those interested in arts and culture. Um, and I think Georgetown is just such a very, ex you know, Bohemian and eccentric yes, town yes. that it really attracts people uh, of that sort. Uh, and, and the state government also tries to uh, support this. So for example, we've set up uh, what we call the Creative uh, Animation uh, Triggers Hub uh, in Georgetown, which is essentially space for creative companies to come in uh, and to you know do business there. So we've gotten some uh, animation studios and so on. So we're trying to actively encourage arts and creativity among the youth. Uh, that, that's that's something that uh, a lot of uh, governments should do, isn't it? But okay, what do you think of the... Uh, I mentioned about education system, but what do you think of the education system at the moment? What do you think... Ha, has it uh, uh, produced really good students and uh, in large number? What, what do you honestly think about well, it? Well, I think by and large, if you ask, are we producing good students? Are we producing uh, smart Malaysians? Uh, well, the answer is yes and no. After all, every year we've got uh, our students making it to the top universities in the world, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, so you can't say the education system is not producing good students. Uh, but the question is, are we producing, you know, you will always have the good schools and good students, but uh, the bigger question is, are we producing enough uh, students or, or how do you say, human talents with the required skills, uh, the required knowledge for the 21st century? So the question is, are we producing students who are able to compete internationally in an economy that is no longer uh, you know, uh, uh, limited by, by the borders of our country? Because today, um, people compete across borders, companies uh, compete across borders with the internet, globalization. Borders mean almost nothing, right? That's and, true. And, and there's also labor migration, uh, and we don't... Uh, two things here, we don't create enough talent um, and we're going to lose our productivity because uh, future jobs are basically jobs that, are, that require skill, that require knowledge, that also require creativity. So is our education system uh, um, uh, producing enough students of that quality? Um, and I think on that front, if you, looked at, uh, if you look at some of the results of international assessments, I mean of course if you look at SPM, A-level results and so on, we do well. Uh, but that just basically means we are doing well at traditional exams. Uh, but when you talk about the 21st century economy, what you need are people who can problem solve and think creatively. Creatively, uh, and on, on a score of you know assessments like Tim's and PISA and so on, which actually assess uh, ability to think and ability to problem solve, rather than ability to memorize answers for an exam, we do quite poorly. And I think that's something that needs to be given more attention to. Yeah, that's true. Um, you said something about the the, the world at the moment and has been uh, has been quite borderless, especially in the existence of the internet and how um, how we, and how 
Philippine government has allowed uh, not the students but people to express themselves on the streets. In a way, you guys are supporting the, uh, their rights of freedom of speech, right? So, what do you think? Are we lacking of that in, in the school education system? We don't allow individuality, we don't allow opinions. Do you think that has affected the quality of uh, the students in the school? Well, I, absolutely. I completely agree with that. Uh, and I've always said, you know, one thing lacking in our education system. Firstly, it's very top-down. It's very... Uh, centralized uh, and what comes with centralization usually is also you know a more authoritative uh, kind of uh, uh, centrally controlled uh, and, and, and uh, kind of environment and what you want these days if you look at the trend that's happening in other countries in Europe uh, in the US uh, Australia uh, even in uh, Asian countries South Korea and so on Taiwan uh, it's an education system that's more decentralized, allows schools more autonomy, uh, gives actually places um, a larger role for the community to be involved. Uh, and empirical evidence everywhere has shown that when schools uh, are more community owned, uh, are basically uh, uh, more decentralized and more autonomous, that you have better outcomes. Uh, because, you know, in the 20th century, you, we were trying to industrialize and you need workers. Um, for that kind of economy. Basically, you need factory workers, you need people to fill up uh, positions in, in, in sort of um, manufacturing. Sure. Um, but production has changed, right? So today, you're talking about knowledge economy, you're talking about creativity. Uh, so you need, you need to produce different kinds of uh, workers, different yes, kinds sure. of students. So the skills have to change. Uh, and what we're teaching our students is still the same thing as what we were teaching them in the 20th century. So I think this is something that we need to uh, you know, make a step forward. Um, and move beyond uh, just the traditional sort of road learning system that we're all so used to. Do you think if the the, you know, the education education system gives uh, a large room for um, for art to come in and be a certain medium for uh, these students to not just voice out but to uh, get to appreciate themselves and other people's voices? Do you think? The education system may may be improved, you know, in a way where, um, you know, uh, as you said, that you know, we can uh, we can get these people to voice out, and we can get these people to to actually uh, you know, open their minds. Do you think that can change things? I think there is a lack of appreciation for uh, creative expression, freedom of expression, uh, generally in Malaysia and in our education system. I mean, if you. You know, you see, if you go to, for example, the UK, uh, where obviously we recognize it as having a very superior education system, and, uh, generally universities that people are allowed to express themselves. When I was studying uh, at SOAS in the University of London, every week there was a protest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. but you know, that's just part of being a student. That's just part of being a young person uh, because you, you have ideals and, and you're usually rebellious and you want to have the space to obviously um, express your ideals and your, your opinions uh, and, and that's probably a bit lacking here in Malaysia and I feel that if we want to move forward and we want to compete in this new economy that we should allow space uh, and, it's, and it's not wrong and it actually actually improves um, you know, our outcomes and the way we think and the way we view life. Uh, that's true.